Hello world, it's me. There's a paragraph in the Z80 documentation that tells us that during a Z80 port output, in addition to the port address and the data byte that's put out, there's also another data byte that goes out onto the bus. And it also says that as part of the port input instruction, the Z80 simultaneously outputs the same data byte. So the question is, what's going on with this red-headed stepchild of a data byte that typically goes unused. In this video, we're going to show what's going on with the Z80 port input and output instruction and how to utilize this to simplify some applications. First, let's look at how the Z80 does a port I.O. And these documented but not widely known ways of over-utilizing, let's say, the port I.O. instructions. And every once in a while, there's a little use capability that exactly fulfills some unusual requirements and really helps simplify a system or software design. And this is just the kind of Z80 capability that sometimes gives it an advantage over the 8080 and the 8085. So to see what I mean, let's look in more detail exactly what happens when the Z80 does a port input or a port output instruction. So reading the pin description from the Z80 technical manual, it says that a0 to A15, so the 16 address bus lines. IO addressing uses the lower address bits to allow the user to directly set up up to 256 input or 256 output ports. A0 was the least significant address bit. And then it goes on and it says the IO request signal, so this is an active low signal, indicates that the lower half of the address bus holds a valid IO address for the IO read or write operation. It also expands on that and says that this pin also goes active during an interrupt cycle to tell you when you can put uh, something onto the bus. We can see from the Z80 IO cycle waveform that the port address is put onto A0, A7 at the very beginning of the very first T state. That allows it to settle a bit, and then the read or write line goes low, depending if it's a read, uh, depending if it's a port input or output. So the read or write line goes low along with the IO request line. A wait state's thrown in for good measure, and then the I/O request line goes high to latch to latch in the input or output data. The port addresses on the Z80, the 8080, and the 8085 are all 8-bit port addresses, so that means the port has to have an address somewhere between 00 to FF in hex or 0 to 255 in decimal. And as we saw in the timing diagram during the I/O operation, the processor puts this port address onto the low byte of the address bus, and then that byte's used by the hardware to decode the port, and if it matches and it's that selected port, then that port will either latch data off from the bus during the I.O. request, or it'll put data onto the bus for the processor to read. But how these processors handle the high byte is different. The 8080 and the 8085 just duplicate the port address onto the high byte. So if you're talking to port say 24 hex, this would go on to the 16-bit address line as you know 0x2424. And in some cases, having the port address on both the low byte and the high byte is convenient on the 88 and the 885, but it's useful so infrequently the designers of the Z80 decided to up the game a bit and put additional information onto the high byte rather than just duplicating the low byte port address. If we look at the Z80 I.O. Remember that the, the Z80 has two ways to address ports. There's either direct addressing where the port address is you know, in the machine instruction, or there's indirect register addressing where the port address is put into the C register, and that allows an incredible amount of flexibility in that the port address that you want to talk to isn't hard-coded in the software. But in either case, the Z80 always puts the port address out onto the lower byte of the address for decoding, just like we saw in the waveforms and just like it does on the 8080 and the 8085. Okay, so what's the subtlety in this instruction? Well, when direct addressing, like an out 24A, where the Z80 is going to take whatever's in the accumulator and send it out to port 24, when the Z80 sets up the addresses, of course it puts the 24 on the low byte of the address, but it puts the contents of the accumulator onto the high address byte. So during the port write cycle, the port address goes from A0 to A7, and the accumulator contents go on A8 to A15. And then the specified register contents go on the data byte, D0 to D7. 
So this high bite, A8, A15, is there for the latching, but it typically goes unused. For an output instruction using indirect addressing via the C register, so for example, out C, comma A, the Z80 puts the contents of the C register onto the low address byte as the port address, just as we would expect. But rather than the accumulator, the B register is placed on the high byte. In other words, the BC register pair is put onto the address bus during an indirect addressing port output. Again, that's data that's there for the latching. So when is this little bit of knowledge useful? You know, what kind of applications would you use this? Well, on, on several occasions in my career, I've had the need to be able to output three bytes of data extremely quickly and simultaneously. So for example, if you want to address an element of an addressable array for self-decoding devices, where there's an X address and a Y address provided, and then the device at that location latches in the data byte for beam positioning for something like a laser, electron, or ion beam, or something like that. The system could, for example, be using a pair of digital to analog converters to drive steering plates or coil, or some combination of positioning and data for another control parameter like beam intensity or substrate bias or the like. In this sort of application, how would you normally go about getting 24 bits of data out to the device? Well, the obvious way would be to output an X address to the latch and then output the Y address to the latch, or if you're going to converters, the X data and the Y data, and then output the data byte. If the data needs to be updated simultaneously, like in a beam controller to prevent stray beam deflections, then you could double buffer the latches so that all of the data is transferred to the outputs with the same strobe. So you strobe it into the first latch, and then when it, all the latches are filled, you strobe it out of those latches into a second latch that outputs it to the device. However, just loading the latches is going to take a minimum of three output instructions, which even if the Z80 didn't force in that wait state to the I.O., it takes a significant number of T states to just complete and get these 24 bits of data out to the device. But if you use this little dangling high byte address feature of the Z80, it gives us a much faster way to move 24 bits or you know, three full 8-bit values from the Z80 to an output port. And in fact, the 24 bits of data to an output port will be output in a single machine instruction cycle, which is you know pretty phenomenal improvement over using three individual output cycles if you were using the 8080 or the 8085. So this is a trick that the 8080 and the 85 simply can't accomplish. Now, there is the obvious limitation that there can be no other I.O. mapped ports in the system because in those applications I just talked about, we were using the low half of the address, which is normally the port address, that's being interpreted as data rather than a port address. So we can't actually use it to identify which port we're talking to. But of course, you can have other ports in the system, they just need to be memory mapped to alleviate that limitation. Okay, so to rephrase, if there's no other ports or the other ports are memory mapped, this leaves the opportunity for the entire contents of the BC register pair to be interpreted as data. And so in a single output instruction, you can send 24 bits of data. One is the high address, one is the low address, and one is the data byte. And all the programmer has to do is to load the data into either the accumulator or the B register prior to the output instruction. Now let's look at an example of the input. Suppose you have a keyboard matrix and you wanna send out a column enable pattern while simultaneously reading the row bits to determine if a key is pressed. So basically, each key is assigned a row column intersection, and when it's pressed, it shorts the two together. So to determine if a key is pressed, the software sequences through all the columns and pulls, you know, like one column low at a time, and then any key pressed in that column will, call, will cause their row to be pulled low, and this row data is pulled back into the processor for interpretation. And so you can tell which key is being pressed by putting a pattern on the columns and then reading in the rows. Now, without this special capability, the Z8, the column pattern would need to be sent out and latched to a port. And then the processor would need to do a subsequent in instruction just to get the row pattern. But using the high address data byte that we just talked about, the Z80 can perform both functions simultaneously. It'll send out the column pattern and read in the row pattern by the same input instruction. So even though it's an input instruction, it sends out this byte of data every time. Just like in an out instruction, the Z80 places the accumulator or the B register onto the high byte, 
during the input instruction. So during any port read, either the contents of the accumulator or the contents of the B register can be used as an output data byte or a control byte to provide some further decoding or configuration, just like it is in this keypad matrix input. And if you look at the waveform, you can see there's generally plenty of time because the address and the data output are valid halfway through the first T-state, and they continue to be valid for three full T-states until the rising edge of the I.O. request. And of course, there's many other applications. You could expand it so that the high byte is simply interpreted as part of the port address. And so that means you could have, you know, 64,000 I.O. ports rather than just the 256. Or you could subdivide a given port into internal registers controlled by the high byte, which is just really kind of the same thing, I guess. In another application, the high byte and the data byte could be simply combined to form a 16-bit data byte. Or for a display application, you could have the high and low bytes be controlling the columns of a display refresh while the data byte enables the individual rows. So you can think of all sorts of applications for this. And I presume that these little subtle operations of the Z80 were intended to be a feature because the 8080 and the 8085 didn't have this, and they were building on the 8080, of course. But I'm not aware of the backstory, and maybe somebody knows the backstory to how these got there. So it's hard to tell if these were originally designed as standalone enhancements for the Z80 that Intel wasn't providing, or if they were part of some kind of an extended port addressing scheme that just wasn't completely implemented, but it was useful on its own. So, you know, at this point in time, it's really hard to figure out what was going on. But either way, as I stated earlier, and while this trick isn't as subtle as the one I described in my last video, it's still not widely known, and it doesn't hurt to inform or remind others of its usefulness. And it's not too surprising that this isn't used more. To quote a Z80 kind of book of knowledge at the time, it says, the contents of the high order bus during the M3 cycle of an IO instruction are generally irrelevant to the interfacing of IO devices. And if you look at the waveforms in that book, they kind of take the flat earth, you know, here be dragons approach to the upper address byte. They simply leave that blank in the waveform. So in all fairness, this particular textbook does go on later to mention what goes on to the high byte. They just say it isn't very useful. So if you've used the Z80 capability, or if you've seen it used in commercial products, let me know. I'm sure it was used in at least a couple of computers. Uh, you know, this diagram I showed you earlier for the keyboard scan was from the, the Spectrum. So I know they used it, and I'm sure that other people used it because it was kind of known at the time. Well, that's it for this video. As always, I appreciate your watching and subscribing. If you have any comments or additional insight to share, please feel free to leave a comment. I'll talk with you later. Bye-bye.